All right. Well, welcome everyone. It looks like the numbers are starting to um, level off on the participants joining in. Um, just before we begin, uh, we would like to acknowledge the, the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which NCS is located. And we want to pay our respects to the Chumash elders, past, present, and future, who call this place their home. As we come together today to bring awareness to issues of equity and justice, we recognize that the Chumash people and so many other indigenous people are still fighting to dismantle the legacies of settler colonialism in their tribal territories. I want to welcome everyone uh, to our um, seminar today and just give a very, very brief overview of, of NCS, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, which is hosting this series. As uh, some of you may not be familiar with the center since you're joining from other parts of campus or even other parts of the country. So we're a, um, a center that focuses on synthesis, bringing ideas and data tools and people together to tackle important questions in the space of environmental science and ecology. And um, in the past year, along with many others, kind of um, trying to think about ways that we can better create an, a more equitable and inclusive environment for not only ourselves, but our, our disciplines and the people that we support through our center and the work that we do. And, and this series is just one small part of our commitment to that and, and really excited to bring um, additional voices and people into the dialogue and, and the kinds of work that we're doing. And so with that, I'm really excited to um, pass this on to Caitlin, who's going to uh, introduce our speaker for today, which I'm really excited to, to have join us in this, this journey of ours. So take it away, Caitlin. Yeah, thanks so much, Ben. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining. It's clear we've got like 130 and counting, which is fantastic. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. This is a webinar format, so no one will be, you're all automatically muted. Um, no one will be able to share video and anything you type in the chat will only go to the, um, the panelists. And then if you have questions throughout, you can drop them in the Q&A. Um, please try and use the, the Q&A rather than the chat just so we can stay organized. And then I'll moderate a, a Q&A at the end um, and field questions for Chris. And uh, automated captioning is available um, and this will be recorded and put on the NC's YouTube channel um, if you need to duck out early or if you wanna share it with your networks. Um, so with that, I am delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Schell, uh, an urban ecologist interested in socio-eco-evo dynamics. Uh, Chris's research focuses on carnivore behavior, physiology, and genomics, and how they're shaped by living in cities. And in addition, his work integrates these principles from the natural sciences with urban studies and critical race theory to address how racial and economic oppression affect urban ecosystems, which I'm excited to learn more about today. And in doing so, his research program spotlights the need to promote justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, or JEDI, in conservation and environmentalist movements. Uh, Chris is a leader in our field, has a strong track record of funding, publication in top journals, science communication, and advocacy for racial justice. And Chris is currently an assistant professor at the University of Washington, Tacoma, uh, where he helped launch the Grit City Carnivore Project, a uh, project to mitigate human carnivore conflict and promote coexistence. And this summer, Chris will be joining the UC community as a faculty member in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management at the University of California, Berkeley, and continuing his work toward investigating how wildlife adapt to cities. And yeah, unfortunately, in this webinar format, we cannot give him the loud and warm welcome he deserves, but please join me in spirit um, as I welcome Dr. Shell and all of you virtually to NCs. Chris, I'll kick it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Caitlin and Ben, for the wonderful introduction. Thank you all for, for having me and letting me chat with you about some of the recent work we've been doing in my lab, as well as some of our collaborators. And hopefully today I inspire you on some new avenues of research, combining and collaborating with our social science neighbors, as well, as well as many of our community members that have quite a bit of information, experience, stories that are, are just wonderful to hear and to share. So in this talk that I titled Wealth, race and wildlife, the impacts of structural inequality on urban wildlife. Y'all will see throughout the talk, I'm going to share narratives of the animals, but also of the people that have helped in this long arc of the work that we've been doing, as well as just pop culture references for those of you that are pop culture literate, or even if you are not, I'm sure you should grab a pen and paper right now because certainly I'll drop a few references here and there for you to be able to watch something later for your weekends, right? So um, I keep it 
of course, because I st stick with charismatic megafauna like this coyote you see here, um, I keep it through the eyes of the animal in ways that help to build cognitive links to materials that sometimes may be harder for folks to grasp. Um, so let's let's go on this journey through the eyes of this coyote as I start us off with a story that got me into studying urban wildlife in the first place. Now, should be noted, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I have seen coyotes my whole life, but didn't really fully understand them as a potential model organism to study in cities until I got to University of Chicago in 2009 for my graduate work. Here is what preceded that. So these photos are actual photos of an actual coyote, yes, in an actual drink cooler. They are not photoshopped. This happened in 2008 in downtown Chicago in a Quiznos of all places. This animal decided to walk into this Quiznos in downtown Chicago, proceeds to walk to the drink cooler, hops into the drink cooler, and yeah, as you're seeing from these photos in real time, starts to fall asleep. Now, mind you, as this is happening, there are folks that are there eating sandwiches. There are folks that are making sandwiches. They all stop what they're doing. They slowly back away as the animal nonchalantly just goes for a straight up power nap. It's there for a good 45 minutes until animal control comes to relocate that animal. And this story highlighted the beginning of my work in urban carnivores and essentially put together this fundamental question for me, which was, what is it about this individual that it decided to get into a drink cooler at a Quiznos of all places relative to other individuals in the population or even adjacent populations? Why did individual A go into a Quiznos and individual B did not? I'm sure now future jokes will start with, so a coyote walks into a Quiznos, right? Fast forward to the more recent past. This photo was taken in Redwood City, California in a chase bank at night. Now, somehow these raccoons were able to get into the locked chase bank, likely looking for food subsidies. I like to think that the inner dialogue between these two individuals is the one on the right is thinking, we're on camera, we have to go, we've been spotted. And the one on the left is saying, I'm not leaving until I get what's mine. I could probably, from 2008 all the way till now, litter multiple examples of wildlife finding ways to live in cities and how certain individuals and populations of individuals within cities seem to behave, look, perform very differently than their non-urban counterparts. So that individual variation byline is gonna be important here through the rest of the talk. I want you to hold that in the back of your mind as we start with our beginning premise. The premise being that social inequality is an ecological issue. And by that token then, we can start to see how injustices shape our landscapes, not only our social landscapes and how society functions, but also how the natural world functions and all of the implications therein. And there's no better place to start with a premise like this than with this handsome Adonis right here. So Jeff Goldblum, who in the original Jurassic Park movie plays Ian Malcolm, has a great set of monologues. One of the most famous being when he starts talking about chaos with the dinosaurs getting out of what seem like secure enclosures for dinosaurs, but certainly they're gonna be flimsy. If you haven't seen the movie, you should see the movie. You probably know what happens, right? Like the dinosaurs get out of their enclosures. They cause havoc. Um, a chaos theorist like Jeff Goldblum would predict that. But in one of the lines, he says how life finds a way. And for sure, for those of you that are interested in wildlife in cities, and if you live in a city, say for instance, like Santa Barbara or Los Angeles or Oakland or San Francisco, you know this well already. Life is finding a way, dot, 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 in cities. So much so that we are seeing examples of different life finding ways in different cities across the globe. Everything from urban smooth coat otters up here in the top left in Singapore, to raccoons in the Pacific Northwest and really every US city, even cities in Germany and cities in Japan and everything in between. These organisms are not only surviving in these human dominated environments, they're thriving. They're thriving in ways that we didn't think possible. 
about 20 to 25 years ago, most ecologists and biologists thought that cities were throwaway systems and that trying to study wildlife in those throwaway systems was not worth it. Come to find out that indeed it's perhaps the best petri dish that we have for understanding evolution and ecological processes, especially in a world that is becoming more and more dominated by people. So much so that conceptual pieces like this have taken a look at how different anthropogenic factors in cities are generating that very same individual variation we are so interested in. So how environmental variation in temperature or say anthropogenic light at night, food subsidies, all shape the individual variation that is pertinent to individual organisms and populations surviving and thriving in cities, influencing their fitness in ways that's very different from their rural or their non-urban counterparts. What I wanna highlight here in all of these syntheses, one resounding truth seems to come out every single time. That truth being that we are at the center of this equation. Humans are the directors and the audience of this veritable screenplay. I like to joke that we are the Lin-Manuel Miranda of this joint. Not only did we compose the songs, we cast all the cast members, we drew the curtains, we even put together the rotating stage. We also are acting in this play. We also are watching it as it unfolds, as is evidenced by this photo here of this buck who is chasing a nearby stander. Likely, this buck has tons of a developmental experience where they've experienced people, but haven't been threatened by them. Maybe this individual animal was fed quite a bit and expects to get food subsidies or expects to be able to have this territory, which then oftentimes results in things like human wildlife conflict. So many of you, including Caitlin, who introduced me, does a lot of work on human wildlife conflict, right? And how human beings, again, are at the center of this equation. So much so that in a recent conceptual piece that we put together, we took a look at society and how it influences the ecological and evolutionary processes therein of urban and non-urban organisms. So we can imagine, for instance, things that happen in society, processes and patterns, like in politics and the economy, human health and demographics, or culture and education, all influence the way in which society functions, but influences the built environment that then therefore influences habitat modification, connectivity, preference and selection, all of which have different projections for organisms from the organismal all the way to the ecosystem level and back, which influences nature's contributions right back to people. One of the case studies that I wanna bring out for y'all that we brought up in the paper was one that I'm sure many of you already have experience with, and that's mosquitoes. Mosquitoes in the urban habitat and in the urban interface. Now, a ton of studies recently have shown how zoonoses and mosquito-borne diseases, as well as tick-borne diseases, are transmitted across the urban spectrum. But one of those recent studies that was published by Katz et al. in 2019 took a look at the distribution of standing water and impervious surface cover, so think concrete and asphalt, relative to the amount of tree cover and predators of mosquitoes in environments, and then they did something really artful. In this study, where they did specifically in Baltimore, they looked as well at socioeconomic gradients, specifically at wealth and wealth gaps. And what they found was that impervious surfaces, which tend to hold a bunch of standing water in many different Baltimore neighborhoods, impervious surface proportions tend to be greatest in these low income areas. There also tend to be less predators of mosquitoes in those same low income areas in Baltimore. Why is that important? Well, it doesn't take a mosquito much to be able to breed and breed successfully. And without any predators, they can grow fast, they can grow large, their reproductive success can go through the roof. And that's exactly what Katz et al. found in these low income areas, that these mosquitoes tend to have greater body size, better reproductive success, greater growth rates. Why is that important? Well, think about the way in which pest management activities are displaced across the entirety of a city. It's not evenly distributed, right? There are certain regions that are likely going to get more broad scale pest management due to resources provided by the city than others will. And whoever makes those decisions has the power and the privilege to do so. So imagine that say in low income areas, there aren't really intensive pest management strategies that are applied to the area. 
pest management resistance, right? So resistance in mosquitoes is therefore highest in those low income areas where the threat or the susceptibility of mosquito borne diseases is also highest. So we can see how society and who's in power and who has the privilege to make decisions influences where pest management services are put, displaced, distributed, which could potentially influence the evolution of those mosquitoes in those environments, making a bad problem even worse. Now, we bring up several other examples, including many urban aquatic examples and examples with small rodents in the environment. But before we get into really any of the details behind those case studies, I think it's important to step back for just a little bit and think about the significance of structure. Now, I have this photo here of UW Seattle's campus and cherry blossom trees in full effect, right? Pure glory. Now, the reason I bring up these trees is because I want y'all to start thinking about the trees and the significance of where the trees are. I want you to follow the trees. And as we know from many different references, this one in particular from Avatar The Last Airbender, trees are huge. They're incredibly important to our ecosystems, to our livelihoods, to our health. So imagine then if certain neighborhoods have trees and others do not, and what dictates that? In this next slide, I'm going to show you a side-by-side -side comparison of two neighborhoods here in the Pacific Northwest that are no more than a half mile away from each other. So the photo on the left is of University Place. Essentially, excuse me, it is a township to the Southwest of Tacoma. Whereas the photo on the right here is of Southeast Tacoma. Again, these two neighborhoods are no more than a half mile apart from each other. If I were to ask you a, a first question, that question being, all right, y'all, which of these two neighborhoods would you say has a greater tree canopy cover or just greater overall vegetation? You wouldn't flinch. You'd be like, Chris, I know this one. This is easy, right? It's the photo on the left. It's University Place. I'm like, all right, cool. That was an easy question. Then I give you an, a follow-up question and I say, all right, between these two neighborhoods, which would you predict has a higher median household income? If you've grown up anywhere in a city across the globe, you still wouldn't flinch at this question either. You, you'd have this intrinsic knowledge of the fact that, yeah, probably University Place, the photo on the left with more vegetation, probably is also more expensive as well. If that was your guess, in fact, you are hitting on something that has a name. It's called the luxury effect. This idea that species richness and biodiversity tend to be positively associated with socioeconomic wealth. Now, I will say as a caveat that there are several examples where that is not the case, where we see the opposite effect of this positive relationship between species biodiversity and socioeconomic wealth. But holding that for a second, for those of you that have just now heard of the luxury effect, I did you a solid. Here are several studies that take a look at the luxury effect worldwide. So what we've seen in many different empirical works is that wealth structures ecological communities at many different trophic levels, from primary producers like trees and other plants, all the way up to tertiary consumers. And it's not just richness and biodiversity, Sometimes it may be native tree abundance, or it could be colonization by certain organisms. And on that point, me being somebody who studies mammals and is interested in wildlife ecology, of late, under the Grit City Carnivore Project here, localized in Tacoma and Seattle, and the Urban Wildlife Information Network, this larger collaborative network of wildlife ecologists, behavioral ecologists, and otherwise, interested in understanding how mammals move and navigate the urban landscape, have been using these remote trigger camera traps to understand how mammals are moving through the city, but then also understand whether or not we are also seeing luxury effects that abound for our mammalian communities across 30 cities in the US. Briefly here, just to give you a bird's eye view of what the Grit City Carnival Project looks like for us in Tacoma, we've been monitoring urban mammals since fall of 2018. This map on the left here is just showing you different spots where we've had cameras before in the past and currently on this urban to rural transect with the urban core being pretty much here along the sound. At any given point in time during our seasonal blocks, we have about 29 to 36 cameras 
out in the field. So we'll set up cameras for approximately 35 days in these seasonal periods, October being our fall season, January being our winter season, April coming up here being our spring season, and then July being our summer season. And we do so in order to see seasonal variation in the number of species we detect, but also to determine whether or not that seasonal variation is important for how these animals interact with their human dominated environment. Some of y'all may be asking, well, Chris, why, why do you have 29 to 36 cameras? That's, that's a weird arbitrary number. Well, the answer to that is, is when you work in urban systems, you're not only mitigating damage from say, abiotic factors like storms or wind or fire, you're not only mitigating damage from wildlife that sometimes wanna rub up against your camera or gnaw at it. You've had, for instance, uh, raccoon claws try and pry open the camera when we have um, a bunch of invertebrate critters crawl into the housing of the camera. But 99% of all the damage is all people related. And certainly as an urban ecologist will tell you, we have tons of stories of just people being on camera, knowing or not knowing the camera is there and what, what that looks like. So uh, a real kind of foray into urban ecology writ large. And we get these traditional wildlife ecology photos that look a whole lot like this, right? So many of you have likely seen these photos. One on the top left of this black-tailed deer posing for their first day of school photo, or these raccoons kind of traversing through the neighborhood. Here we have a coyote and an opossum that are venturing to take a sniff at the lure that we've put on this tree. My personal favorite of all of the photos is the one to the top right. This was taken about five blocks away from UW Tacoma's campus. And these raccoons are like practicing their parkour. My favorite, he right here, this little one is my favorite individual putting out all of the stops. Not only are these cameras good for still images, they're also good for video. So, you know, I had to show the cute and cuddly. I, I can't not show the cute and cuddly, but certainly this bobcat kit here posing for us and, and looking as just uh, immaculate as it can. Notice the date here, March 9th, 2020. So in follow-up studies, we're hoping to use our cameras to understand whether or not stay-at-home orders have changed temporal and spatial activity of these animals as they've moved across the landscape. So stay tuned for that in the sequels and follow-up to this talk. But for today, what I wanna do is show you all some preliminary data from some of the camera type data we have captured looking at the effect of socioeconomic wealth and species richness. So briefly, these two figures here are from Seattle and Tacoma. The top is from Seattle, the bottom is from Tacoma. The x-axis for both of these figures here on the right is income scaled by cost of a one bedroom apartment. That allows us to capture the full variety of housing types in the area and not have to lose, say, some data because certain environments or certain neighborhoods may be more well represented by apartments than single family homes. And then on the y axis, we have species richness. So that is the number of species that we were able to detect on camera. So just a kind of sum of the number of species we can detect at a given area with each of these black dots representing a site and these bars of these black dots representing our confidence intervals in those data. So as I mentioned earlier, we had our cameras out during these seasonal periods. So certain seasons, we get more species on the camera than others. And this is essentially taking into account the variation we see across seasons. Now, briefly, if y'all are interested, I can talk to you later about the Bayesian mammalian occupancy model that we put together. It was a multi-species, multi-season model. And then all of these point estimates were extracted from the posterior distribution of that model. Then we ran just Pearson correlation coefficients to determine whether or not there was a relationship between wealth of a neighborhood and species richness. And even in cities as green as Seattle and Tacoma, we are still seeing this positive relationship, albeit not as strong in Tacoma, but certainly still a relationship where wealth does in fact predict the number of species we detect on our cameras. Now, it should be noted that hopefully by the end of the summer, we will have our empirical analysis out that looks at 20 plus cities in the 32 cities that we have under the UN network that really gets at in a fine scale what these data look like across many of our cities that are in many bioregions from Phoenix, Arizona, all the way up to Edmonton, Alberta and everything in between. 
So hopefully we'll be able to share some, again, more data for y'all in SQL follow-ups to this talk. It should be noted though, that up to this point, I've been talking a lot about the biotic or the living factors that are influenced by socioeconomic wealth, but I haven't gotten into any of the abiotic or non-living components of the environment. Now I like to dub this section of the talk the Avatar Last Airbender, again, you, you got to watch the show. It's amazing. It's on Netflix. So none of y'all have an excuse now, right? And I'm stretching the earth metaphor a little bit here because earth in the show is not necessarily living things, but you get where I'm going with this, right? We kind of talked a little bit about earth. Now we're going to talk a little bit about water and how luxury effects also influence air and how luxury effects also influence fire, the figurative fire here being urban heat island effects. So let's start there with fire. So for those of you that have not heard of the urban heat island effect before, essentially it denotes this process by which cities tend to be three to 10 degrees hotter than their rural or non-urban counterparts. The primary reason for that is the relative proportion of impervious surfaces, there's that word again, right? So concrete and asphalt and building densities relative to the amount of green space cover, tree canopy cover, other vegetation, so on and so forth. And that influences a bunch of processes like heat absorption and retention, plant transpiration and water evaporation from the soil, and water penetration. Now here's where it gets interesting. There are several scientists that have been working on the urban heat island effect, and some that have taken a look at, at the census level, can we measure surface temperatures on average in a census block and then compare that to median household income. What would we find if we did an exercise like that? We find something that looks a little bit like this. Now this is a map for Seattle, but if you navigate yourself to the resource at the bottom of this slide, it will show you similar maps for the city that you're in. So if you're in a populated city, Many of you are in Santa Barbara, many of you are in cities in California, or you may be in cities across the nation. If you go to this resource, you likely will find the same allegory maps for your city. And what customarily tends to happen with almost every single city that has been surveyed is that the areas that tend to have the hottest surface temperatures within these census blocks also tend to have the lowest median household income. Again, if you're following the trees, if you're thinking like a tree, then you're thinking, well, yeah, duh, those areas tend to have greater impervious surfaces and less tree cover. We're gonna get into why that's the case here, but this is important, right? This is the inequity that we're starting to peel apart here and see how many abiotic factors are not evenly distributed across the landscape. So that's, that's fire. Well, what about air? So a recent study that was published by Christopher Tessum et al. in 2019 and several others that we've recently reviewed in our recent science paper takes a look at air pollution inequity, many of those studies of which take a look at this, this pollutant called PM 2.5. PM just stands for particulate matter. The 2.5 is for the diameter of the size of that particulate matter. Now, what's interesting in the Tessum et al. paper is they did something really unique. They took a look at racial ethnic exposure to air pollution and controls for differences in income gradients. And they created this pollution inequity index after the fact. So this pollution inequity index here denotes the relative amount of consumption of goods that generate air pollution that you are making relative to the pollution, air pollution burden you are experiencing. If you are below this zero line threshold, this black line right here, then that means you are consuming more goods that generate air pollution than you are experiencing the burden of that air pollution. Whereas if you are above this zero line threshold, that means that you're experiencing more air pollution burden than you are consuming goods that generate the air pollution. This pale blue line right here is for white Americans across the cities that were surveyed. This orange line right here is for Latinx Americans. This green line is for Black Americans. And this is from, notice the x-axis, 2000 to 2015. So I bet if we were to take 2016 to 2021, these data likely aren't gonna change, right? Here what we're seeing is that Black and Brown communities are disproportionately being affected by air pollution relative to their white counterparts in US cities. 
perhaps air pollution is incredibly topical today because, well, one, we'd be doing all of this in person if <laughs> air pollution wasn't also linked to say who's contracting and dying from COVID. And certainly, right, COVID has thwarted our plans as well, but climate change is exacerbating many of these issues and many of these direct and indirect links that cause this human wildlife conflict, disease being one of the most profound of conflicts. So a recent paper that was published by Kimberly Terrell and colleagues in Louisiana took a look along the stretch of the Mississippi called Cancer Alley. Some of y'all may, may be asking, why is it called Cancer Alley, Chris? Well, after emancipation during Southern Reconstruction, many Black residents, previously slaves, were relegated to neighborhoods along the stretch of the Mississippi. There were also a ton of industrial sites, toxic waste sites that were co-located along this region. To this day, Louisiana has some of the most relaxed EPA regulations of any state across the nation, which allows for a huge generation of say PM 2.5 in this region. And also to date, most of these communities are still predominantly black due to many official and unofficial laws on the books that relegated those community members, even if they had the economic capital to live elsewhere along the stretch of the Mississippi. So then it's no wonder that in current times where air pollution is the greatest here in this deep blue, these also tend to be predominantly black communities that are then contracting and dying from COVID. This is a urgent issue for climate change as well as climate change continues to exacerbate wildfires and other issues that detrimentally affect air quality and influence air pollution loads. So y'all that are in Santa Barbara and in California, you already know this. I don't even need to, to really bring this back up again, but this is a photo here from about five, six months ago from the San Francisco region, right? This is the Bay Area. Look how orange that is, it looks like Mars. The photo on the right, for those of you that are movie buffs, this is Blade Runner 2049 with Ryan Gosling. Now, granted, most of y'all would rather say you'd rather be with Ryan Gosling. I mean, hell, I would. But for real, I'd rather be with Ryan Gosling in the photo on the right relative to the photo on the left. Think about how climate change paired with, say, disease dynamics are influencing the most disenfranchised of our community members. Right? These are issues that we need to think about quick, fast, and in a hurry because our planet, nay, us, right, human beings, we depend on finding the strategies now to be able to mitigate these issues. Finally, water. Now, these photos don't need a caption at all. They're all photos taken from the Flint, Michigan water crisis, which to this day, justice has not been fully served to those that have been afflicted by changes in water quality with water being pumped through leaded pipes, old leaded pipes that influence a predominantly black and brown community and their health. It should be noted that I bring this example up specifically because it helps us to start diving in to how we disentangle wealth and race and how wealth alone doesn't predict everything. It's good up to a point, right? It's a good proxy up to a point, but socioeconomic status is not just the amount of money you make. It's not just the amount of money you make. It's also the class that you are in. It's also your ability to get a job. It's also your ability to be transported to that job, your access to healthcare, your access to jobs generally, right? Your access to economic capital. And to that point, a recent meta-analysis done by Curious et al., and there's another one that was done by Chamberlain et al. in 2020, take a look at all of the empirical luxury effect studies and separate them between flora, here on the left, and fauna on the right, so plants and animals. And then they do something that's artful as well. They separate it by land use consideration from residential to non-residential areas, and then density of the city, so how densely packed a city is. And they look at studies that show positive relationships like we would predict. So that means increasing wealth, means increasing biodiversity, neutral relationships where there's no relationship at all between wealth and biodiversity, and negative relationships where increasing wealth actually predicts decreases in biodiversity and species richness. And here, here's the takeaway, y'all. It's not clear cut. Yeah, maybe in residential areas, the majority of the studies 
for plants and animals tend to show this positive relationship. But it's not always the case. It's not 100%. And when you go from residential to mixed residential and non-residential to non-residential areas, you start to see some really interesting changes in how these ecological parameters are responding to sociological parameters. The same can be said when you take a look at the difference in density of the city where the study is taking place, which means that, again, wealth doesn't predict everything. We need to dig deeper into what generates these wealth disparities. And to that point, we recently published a paper that takes a look at how structural racism and classism, influenced by our systemic biases, then shape all the landscape heterogeneities that we just talked about. So things like law enforcement and residential segregation and resource allocation and gentrification determines where the impervious surfaces are, determines where the urban heat island intensity is, determines where the green space is gonna be, all the way up to disease dynamics, which therein influence the ecology and the evolutionary biology of the species that live in and yes, outside of our cities. So the way in which we treat each other is the way in which we treat our natural landscape. And if we treat each other in a very inequitable manner, so too will we see that inequity bear out in our ecological systems. And to that point, perhaps there is no better pop culture reference example than this one right here, which is relatively more recent. This is a wallpaper photo for the HBO Watchmen series. And Regina King plays this character, Sister Knight. And we get a little bit into Sister Knight's history. Now, I'm not going to really ruin the show for you. Definitely, this is of all of the things that you need to binge. This is one of them, right? And this one is particularly bingeable because in the first episode of the first 10 minutes of that first episode, we get into actual U.S. history. And that U.S. history is around the 1921 Tulsa Massacre. For those of you that have just now heard of the Tulsa Massacre, briefly, the story goes that there was a black man who was accused of assaulting a white woman in a nearby hotel in Tulsa, was immediately taken to prison and apprehended by the authorities. And there were rumblings going on that that black man were, was to be lynched the very next day. So there were members of his community that came to his defense and to his aid. And they were there at that local prison for a little bit before they peacefully walked away. But as they were doing so, they were accosted by a mob of white men. It didn't just stop there. They proceeded on the town of Tulsa, Oklahoma and raised it to the ground. More than 300 people lost their lives and thousands were displaced. Now, to put this into context, y'all, Tulsa, Oklahoma at this point was considered the Black Wall Street of America. And that's incredibly significant because of the fact that after emancipation, slaves were given this lie of 40 acres and a mule, right? They weren't given any of that. And in fact, slave owners were given reparations for lost property. So these ancestors built something out of nothing. And in a matter of hours, it was gone like that. Unfortunately, this is not the only example of, say, urban systems changing overnight due to racial hostility, systemic oppression, or otherwise. There are many systems, many cities in the record books that show this large transformational kind of aspect to the cities. And why I bring this example up is because of the fact that there were unofficial and official government-sponsored policies that were put into place that radically changed the landscape under our feet. So wherever you are, wherever you are sitting, right, we had a land acknowledgement at the beginning of this talk. There is blood baked into the concrete where you are to the point that one of perhaps the most profound and widespread of these government-sponsored policies was redlining. So many of you at this point have likely already heard of redlining, but for those of you that have not, redlining was the large broad scale practice sponsored by the US government where maps like the one that you see here for Oakland were created to enshrine residential segregation of black and white communities across America. So these green and blue areas, which were designated as A and B areas, were highly desirable areas. That was the term they would use, highly desirable, which oftentimes meant it was code for mostly white, all white really, and mostly wealthy. 
Whereas the yellow and the red regions here, which were C and D respectively, were deemed hazardous or unfit to live in. Guess who lived there, right? Black and brown communities and low income folk all along that stretch of land. You probably also can guess where were most of the toxic waste sites co-located in these regions in the city. So this policy persisted from 1933 all the way to 1968. And there are stories from our elders and ancestors that show how many of the unofficial and official policies that were put in place were helped to, again, continue this mechanism to roar along. So for instance, many of these green and blue regions would often be called sundown towns. A sundown town denotes that if you were black and you were caught in those neighborhoods past sunset, then you would be apprehended and lynched on site. Or there are stories of even if you had as a, a black family, the economic mobility to afford homes here, if you were able to get past the bank stopping you from getting a loan or from say housing agents spying on you and then reporting you to the authorities for even being in the neighborhood and you somehow magically were able to get into those neighborhoods, which happened, right? You would have crosses burned on your front lawn from the KKK telling you to get up out of there. So if you wanna learn more about the history of redlining, I provide two resources for you. The first being The Color of Law written by Richard Rothstein. The second, being this resource put together by the University of Richmond's Mapping Inequality Project. Now notice here, all of these maps are for all, most all of the cities that exist in the United States. In this slide, I couldn't even put all of the cities there. We started at 61 and we go to 108, but there are more before it and there are more after it. As an ecologist, right, I'm, I'm certainly interested in things like habitat fragmentation, connectivity, gene flow, if I'm looking at these different cities like Tacoma or Seattle or San Francisco or Oakland, I'm thinking to myself, well, where are the trees? Where's the vegetation? Trees take a long time to grow, y'all. So that means that in these blue and green areas, you likely have more mature trees and secondary succession has kicked in. Whereas in these yellow and red areas, probably not so much. So if I'm a coyote and I'm navigating the city, Prime habitat for me is probably in these blue and green regions, and I want to be there because chances are I have greater refugia. I don't have to deal with people nearly as much, right? Maybe the number of pollutants are a lot lower in those green and blue areas than they are in those red and yellow areas. Now, all of these predictions, they're not really coming out of nowhere. They're, they're being built off of studies that are already starting to show the effects of redlining on our biological systems. Specifically, a paper that was put out by Dexter Locke and company took a look at these A through D designated areas and then looked at tree canopy cover across 37 U.S. cities. And here's what they found. In those 37 U.S. cities, the majority of cities demonstrated this influence where A and in some instances B regions customarily have greater tree canopy cover relative to C and D regions. For context, y'all, redlining was abolished in 1968. That was more than 50 years ago. And we're still seeing the effects of tree canopy cover that was established way back when, right? Mid 1900s on our urban ecological systems right now. So if you're doing work in the city, you can't look away from this. You have to be aware of the heterogeneities that are created by segregatory policies and practices enshrined and baked into the concrete. So hopefully up to this point, I've convinced you that social inequality is in fact an ecological issue and generates the heterogeneity that we see in cities. And to that very same token then, if it is in fact the case in environmental justice and anti-racism are the most potent forms of urban conservation and sustainability that we have today. I would argue they have to be the prerequisite to any conservation work that we do in and outside of the city. Otherwise, we will never see long-term success. And that means we need to deconstruct previous systems of oppression, reconcile previous ills and structural violence, and mobilize our communities and give our communities voice through things like co-production and community engagement where we do science not in a vacuum, not just academia alone being gunslingers or vigilantes per se, but doing it in a way that allows us to do the work 
together. Should be noted that I'm here giving a talk for NCs, right? And am super humbled and thankful to do so. But this content has been content shared by my elders and ancestors for a while now, right? Environmental health, in fact, is one of the tenets of civil rights. It is a prerequisite to civil rights. The access to a healthy environment is, in fact, the access to civil rights, which means that for us, for those of you specifically that are interested in conservation biology, I challenge you to think of conservation success not as just reproductive success, not as just translocation success or genetic variability, but also as building equitable capital and fighting poverty for people, for people. Many environmentalist movements and traditionalist conservationists in the past have thought of human beings as being completely absolved from nature in order for nature to thrive. And that's not entirely true. Indigenous folks and folks of color have been in this space for millennia, influencing biodiversity in a positive way. And by us creating more equitable urban systems, then we can think about the ways in which we do conservation long term, long term. And that means Everything from building affordable housing that reduces, e reduces displacement and increases ecological stability to increasing accessible health care, all the way to, yes, strengthening voting rights. So in that way, those that are on the margins have the ability to have a voice to these environmental issues, and they have a lot to say. So it should be also noted, right, I'm giving many of y'all some things to think about for conservation, but some of you may be on this call and you're like, I'm not in the sciences at all, or I'm in microbiology studying this really small protein chain. How, how exactly do I help? We all have a role, y'all. And this starts with us. We have the responsibility to work on this stuff in-house, right? And that means thinking about how the structural changes need to happen in our own systems. So a recent paper that we put together called Recreating Wakanda takes a look at how we abolish anti-Black racism in eco-evil practice in academia while amplifying black excellence in the departments as well. It, it really very much starts with us. And you, I bet you can ask anybody, any person of color, any woman, any person that represents for the LGBTQIA plus community that we need that representation. We can't have these conversations. We build interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary links without thinking about the ways in which we put together long-term and short-term solutions. Everything from doing outreach in majority black and brown K through 12 schools to positioning black and brown scholars as keynote speakers, panelists, and symposia. Again, thank you all for the drop and for the airtime, which I very much appreciate. Elevating those that are on the margins allows us to be better at our jobs. And also reassessing our roots is important. Here I'm showing y'all two photos of two black scholars that were white, under the mat until recently, many of those narratives were resurfaced to understand their importance in conversations that we think are novel today. They ain't novel. Conversations about climate justice, conversations about environmental racism, conversations about animal behavior and how we interact with the natural world. That started with Charles Henry Turner here on the left. That started with George Washington Carver here on the right. Everybody thinks of them as just like, oh, well, that's a dude that did peanuts. Or, oh, that guy, he, he wasn't even a faculty member. These are the folks that had been doing the work way before they got the acknowledgement to do the work. They weren't alive long enough to be able to give them their acknowledgement. So that means we also need to decolonize our own science. This influences the way in which we do our jobs. So to that point, one of the last two slides I wanna share with y'all, and again, Marvel drop, for those of you that have not seen the first Iron Man movie, do yourself a favor, get a Disney Plus account, do it today, right? Like at the very end of the first Iron Man movie that popped off all of these different series, in the post credit scene, Iron Man is high off of his fame. He just told everybody he's Iron Man. Tony Stark is like in the clouds, right? Thinking he's hot, you know what? And then Nick Fury comes into his living room and tells him straight up, you think you're the only superhero in the world, Mr. Stark? you become part of a bigger universe. You just don't know it yet. So this is my call to y'all as budding scholar activists to think about the ways in which you do your job and how you do it, how you pay it forward effectively and think about how you center your research and how you do science communication, how you decolonize the way in which you do communication and make sure that all folks have the ability to participate in the work. And it should be noted, I started this journey through the eyes of the animal full circle. 
So here is a video, apologize for the choppiness, of a coyote puppy who's only about seven and a half, eight weeks old at a captive coyote facility in Millville, Utah. Now, one of my good friends and collaborators who served as a mentor on my graduate committee, Dr. Julie Young, and I put together this study to look at puppy personality and behavior and how it developed as a function of the parents. This puppy here, we gave the nickname Kal-El, which for those of you that are DC fans, you know is for Clark Kent, who is Superman, because puppy was straight up fearless. Coyote puppy should not be as close to you. He's about 10 feet away from me, nonchalantly sniffing the ground like nothing's, nothing's wrong, everything's okay, I'm just gonna keep sniffing the ground. Eventually I pan over to the rest of the family and you see that his siblings and even the parents are much further away. They're like, you got this cow, we gonna hang back here. So for me, the burning question, really my wheelhouse of animal personality and individual variation led me to think about what are the mechanisms that influence individual variation within nuclear families and across families? Which led me to think about, well, what environments are they living in, especially if they're in urban environments? What is it about those urban environments that influence those mechanisms? Which led me to think about, okay, well, what is it about urban environments that shapes certain behaviors but not others? Well, it's heterogeneity, duh. Like as an ecologist, we always think about differences in landscapes and how there are these environmental mosaics, which then, of course, you have to think, well, what generates the heterogeneity? It's people. And it's not all peoples. It's not all peoples. It's the peoples in power and privilege that have the ability to make decisions on shaping the landscape. Think about, for instance, the dichotomy between public and private lands. Think about, for instance, how different types of communities, whether it be communities with a ton of high rises or those that are single family homes. Think about the size of those lots, right? If I'm a coyote seeing the urban landscape through the eyes of this animal, I'm thinking to myself, well, yeah, of course I'm gonna go to the neighborhoods that have larger green spaces because they probably have more Eastern cottontail. Maybe they have more rats, who knows? Maybe they have cats that I can depredate. So I'm gonna go hunt up there. Why would I wanna waste my time in neighborhoods that don't have any of that refugia or any of those resources? At the end of the day, seeing the landscape through the eyes of the animal, you see the inequity of access too, which means that folks that are in low income areas or areas that don't have access to green space, they're missing out on the ability to experience nature. And that in and of itself should be a crime. So with all of that, I'd like to acknowledge all of the collaborators that have helped in much of the synthesis, and there are many, so many that they couldn't even fit on this page. So all of my collaborators here at the UW system, as well as UC Berkeley, all my collaborators for Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium, my UN collaborators in the UN network, the Socio-Eco Evo RCN that looks at urban evolutionary ecology, the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, and all of the community partners that have been working with us thus far here in the Pacific Northwest. And with that, I will open for any questions y'all may have. Thank you so much, Chris, for a really rich and inspiring and thought-provoking talk. Um, you get an applause from one, but I'm sure many other people are applauding in spirit. Um, that was great. And I have a lot of questions for you, but maybe we can geek out about behavioral plasticity and occupancy models another time, because there's a lot of good questions coming in from the chat. Um, for sure, and I thought I, sure. I would start with one um, that I think will, will is really going to be, I think, of interest to all of us. Um, which is, is a question about how we can wield our power in smaller academic groups for change. You know, a cohort of graduate students, a smaller lab group, people who might feel a little bit powerless to, to make big institutional change. What are your recommendations? Yeah, my first recommendation is thinking about the way in which we have our reward system structured. So in the past, and Caitlin, you could probably co-sign on this, right? Many of the opportunities that were available would be volunteer opportunities where the only way you can get experience is by volunteering your time. That's assuming that you have the economic capital to do so. I was lucky enough to fall in as a McNair scholar, as an undergrad. Otherwise, honestly, y'all, I don't know if I would be here. Like I was a McNair scholar that was able to get paid to do the research. And the first species I ever studied, y'all are gonna trip on this when I tell you that they were cute. I, I am telling you they were cute. Were these tarantula species in the Dominican? You're like, oh, tarantulas, they ain't cute. They're not coyote puppies, but they were, right? I was able to do that work because somebody was paying me and valued me as a contributor in their lab. And then I, I had a bunch of mentors that valued me beyond the science. 
I oftentimes will hear from many folks that are women or people of color or identify as queer that their experience is not valued. It's only about the objective science. Y'all, the, the big lie in all of this, like scientists aren't objective, we're human beings. I was a psychology major. I thought I was gonna be a social psych like person in the future. I just so happen to be somebody who's an ecologist, but I learn, I take those lessons and say, you know what? Like everybody is biased. We all have our own biases. So walking in, know that we ain't perfect, right? I have a, I have a two and a five-year-old who's soon to be three. Like there are certain days I ain't got it. And I make sure that I tell my students and my postdocs that, hey, guys, today I don't have it. I could use your help. And, and really taking down the curtain, demystifying the entire process and making sure that folks that are on the come up see that they have the ability to be in this position. Right. I want many of y'all that are younger, take my job here in a little bit. I would love for you to take my job in the future. That way I can I can chill. Um, the other piece is that for those that are upper level, right, your associate or full faculty, or maybe you're in government work, y'all have the most power and privilege to be able to make things happen. Relinquishing that power to early career researchers or or being superbly strategic about who you collaborate with even down to who you cite is important. If you invite a speaker, right, to give a talk, make sure you pay them. If you have somebody who you wanna collaborate with in the community, put them on the paper. Make sure that they have that paper to access. If they don't have the paper to access, give them the, give them the damn PDF. Like, build, take down the walls that were built up for only white heteronormative males. It's not like that. Well, it is like that and we need to fix it. It shouldn't be like that anymore, right? So that's that's our charge is we got a lot of work to do. Thank you for that. Now, I think it gets to some some interesting, I mean, the idea of positionality, I think is something social scientists have have dealt with a lot better than, than we have and recognizing that, that we are we are subjective. And and I think that's also a good plug for open science, which is something, you know, we're trying to champion at NCs, break down those walls. Um, all right, so the next question we have um, is about the luxury effect and how structural inequality and this luxury effect can have an impact on human perceptions of wildlife, especially of nuisance species, uh, raccoons and coyotes. And then how, you know, I guess these perceptions might impact the behavior of these nu nuisance species. So I guess more broadly, how human wildlife conflicts are playing out against this backdrop of the luxury effect. Right, yeah, so one of the kind of minutia we didn't get into about the luxury effect is that sometimes y'all had seen, some of those studies showed neutral relationships, but they're not wholly neutral. So you may see the same number of species detected in an area, but the species composition completely changes. So whereas in a wealthier neighborhood, you may see more deer, you may see a bobcat or a mountain lion move through the landscape. In lower income areas or areas that are further away from larger green spaces, you'll probably see more raccoons, maybe more Canada geese, maybe potentially more turkeys, domestic cats, rats and the like, all of the species that are oftentimes considered these nuisance species. And that connection to wildlife too needs to be reconciled. And that community's perspective needs to be valued because when they're saying, well, we don't want all of these animals in our system. Yeah, that makes tons of sense. Of course you wouldn't want those animals in your system. So what are ways that we can build our urban system? So this is us leaning on urban planning, urban design, urban studies. How do we build our systems with ecological complexity that allows for native and some functionally relevant non-native species to live in those environments. And even at that point, say you plant all the trees in the world in, in these environments, and say you've been able to guard against gentrification, you don't displace peoples, some community members still, still don't want trees in the yard because they say, well, they bring bees or they bring other invertebrate pests. I don't want them in my house. That's a valid opinion too, y'all. There are workarounds to this. We gotta be creative. So one of the ways we could be creative is think like, well, you know, another way we can pr promote green space in an environment is think about how do we build green space along say building structures or even put in community gardens that allow for this hub of access for community members, also providing food sovereignty. So one of my new colleagues and collaborators, Dr. Elizabeth Hoover, who's at Berkeley, looks at exactly that, right? Indigenous practices and how they can be paid forward to the way in which we look at urban gardens as a means of decolonization. We can use that and the urban gardens, they serve as huge, awesome stepping stones for things like bees, which are on massive declines across the globe. So put in an urban garden, 
food sovereignty for everybody. We're eating food that's local. Many of you are all about that farm to table mentality. Look, you got your urban garden there. And on top of that, we get to save the bees. It's a win, win, win all the way around. Thanks. Now, I mean, yeah, it gets to this like, the concept of heterogeneity, heterogeneity of goals, heterogeneity of values, and you know, where can we find win-wins? Um, we've got a lot more questions coming in, but I realize we're over time. Do you have time for one more? And, and yeah, absolutely. I have time for a couple of questions. Okay, great. Um, I, there's a question here um, about your how you include community members in the science as it's being carried out, how people feel about cameras and surveillance in their communities, um, and how you navigate uh, those dynamics. Yeah, absolutely. So what we do, and it, it takes time, right, because we have to build trust. So we oftentimes, before we ever set a camera out, we'll talk to public and private landowners and ask them, are they interested in the study? We give them information about the study and we have open data sharing. So camera images are great for community members to share with the rest of their constituents. And we say like, here are what the images look like. Here's what we're hoping to do. We've done so with say a community in Fox Island here in the Pacific Northwest, as well as with Vashon Island. And we share all of the data that we have. So if we have any findings, we're like, hey guys, we found this, what do you think about it? Um, so we lead at the very beginning of the project before we even start collecting data with saying, what do community members want? And how can we work together to kind of achieve what you want? And at the same time, think about ways that we can build a larger story and narrative. Because the best way to share the data, right? And the science is through these narratives. So the narratives of the people are just as important as the narratives of the animals. And we lead with that mantra. So if we go to say a private residence and they don't want a camera, we're like, all right, that's fine. You definitely don't have to have a camera. If you'd like, we're, we're welcome. We're, we're happy to share data with you if you're apprehensive. And we don't, we don't, we aren't pushy about it. Um, the other thing we oftentimes do is we'll have schools, K through 12 schools, be their own sponsored scientists. So we get cameras and we give them the cameras free of charge. We don't charge them anything. And they keep those cameras for whatever they want to use. So they collect data in those seasonal blocks that we have. And at the same time, they could change them to video whenever they want. The, the kids will go in front of the camera and like do their best um, cover album <laughs> impression. Like it's just, it's just super cute. And some schools have um, stipulations where we don't take the human photos. I'm like, that's fine. We don't really care about the people anyway. I mean, we care about the people, but we want to see, we want to see the animals. So building, building trust, I think is really important and it takes time. It takes time just like anything else that we do. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, let's do one more uh, kind of positive one to one to close. And we will, for those that uh, didn't, weren't able to get your questions answered and, and for those that have, have been, I see a lot of comments coming in the chat. Um, we'll package them all up and send them to Dr. Shell just so he gets your feedback and thoughts. Um, so feel free to continue to drop those in. Uh, but our last question to close is, um, this person's you know, recognizing a challenge of helping our students of color see ecology and environmental science being of value to them, um, seeing themselves represented. And so including role models like yourself, um, who else do you recommend? Who are some, some people whose work you admire that you recommend to other people check out? Yeah, I got a long list. So <laughs> um, I'll start with Dr. Naima Harris, who is at University of Michigan right now, also a carnivore ecologist. And she is phenomenal. She is fire. All the work she's doing is is superb. I consider her as a mentor as well as somebody y'all have in house, Dr. Ray Wynn Grant, right? So I see Ray and Naima definitely as mentors and, and folks that I, I lean on a lot and see as, as just inspiration to the work I do. And then finally, Danielle Lee, well, not finally, there's so many others. Danielle <laughs> Lee is phenomenal. Y'all probably see a theme, right? Black women are, are really pushing the narrative forward in ways that need to be, be had. So Danielle Lee is at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville does a lot of animal behavior work and is also a mammologist. She is phenomenal. Um, Dr. Fuchsia Ann Hoover, I think I saw her name on the call. She is great too. All the work she does in environmental and climate justice is fantastic. There are tons of graduate students that are pretty, um, pretty on top of it in, on Twitter and otherwise. So there are a couple graduate students that are joining the new lab when I moved down to Berkeley. So Tyus Williams and Cesar Estien are really great follows to take a look at. Um, I think there were several others that have been giving talks recently. Shane Campbell Stanton is at UCLA and does a lot of urban evolutionary ecology work on herps, but he and I are hoping to do some work on carnivores as well. Um, uh, Deja Perkins does quite a bit of work. She's, she is a graduate student, hopefully soon to be PhD candidate um, and does a lot of work in community science 
and bird ecology in the southeast part of the United States. Of course, there is like J. Drew Lanham who does work and is also a poet and his poetry is, is slamming literally and figuratively. Uh, God, I mean, I could keep going on and on. <laughs> Scott Edwards is like the, the, he definitely, I think for all of us that are in that second generation of black scholars, one that we look up to quite a bit. And for those of y'all that didn't know, Scott, he had done after George Floyd murder, a huge across country bike trip to kind of raise awareness. He is one of certainly the forefathers for us of evolutionary biology. I probably can keep going on, <laughs> on and on and on for the next 30 minutes. I'm gonna just stop there and say like, there, there are a lot of us. There are a lot of us we're representing. There are a lot of us that are at the graduate level and on the come up as well. So keep your eyes open. Great, thank you. And, and I, I see a lot of uh, people asking for these, these names to be listed. And I can, you know, the names that you just listed, I can, can write them down somewhere and make sure we're gonna send out a follow-up and put this on YouTube. So I can post a list to people's Twitter. And if there are other people, and it's probably like, as soon as you sign off, it's like, ah, I forgot to say these people. We can, we can throw them on there too, or any other um, platforms that people would check out that are really awesome. doing a good job of amplifying diverse voices. So um, thank you so much uh, again for this talk. It was really thought provoking and inspiring. Um, and we're, we have one more talk in this series. Um, I should have queued up the date and time, but I will send out the information in, in the follow-up email. I think everyone put their emails in. Um, but Dr. Lydia Jennings will be talking about indigenous data sovereignty and governance the first week in April, which we're very excited for. Um, and Ben, I don't know if you wanna close things off. No, just with a huge thank you, Chris. It was a fantastic talk and really inspirational. And thank you for your time and, and all that you're doing. Great to have you. Absolutely, thank you. I, I very much appreciate you. All right, thanks. Take care, everybody.